The lesson last week was about the end of the world and the plagues at the end of the world and uh, how they're going to come, where they're going to be and how bad it's going to be and so on. Uh, we don't want to be too negative because um, God saves us through it all. <laughs> and we can look forward to that and with joy. We can come before the for Heavenly Father knowing that He's watching out for us and caring for us and protecting us. So this week, though, is the Battle of Armageddon. It was the next that I had already planned and had prepared beforehand. So I've got, it looks like a lot of pages, but it's just large print. <laughs> um, the Battle of Armageddon. Interesting uh, topic. And uh, nowadays, it's this religious topic has snuck out into the world of the movies and videos and whatever, where they're uh, trying to display something that they can't display, can't show. But they're attempting to show the um, fant fantasy world and the end time uh, story, you might say. But they're uh, just making it so that people squirm in the seats, you know, they, they just sensationalize everything of Bible prophecy if they're even close to it. Sometimes Bible stories on, and videos, uh, they're not too close to the real story. <laughs> and they include things that are not in the Bible or uh, however you want a word that they add to and subtract from. Anyway, uh, so because there's uh, a fuzzy ground, I guess you might say, about how bad the battle's gonna be and what's gonna happen, and so they want to sensationalize it. So they're trying to make a, uh, visions of gloom and doom uh, in our modern warfare uh, uh, that's not there. Um, so the, the Bible will talk about horses or talk about uh, knives and swords and spears and so on. Well, that's not our modern day battle tools, um, but they, they, they try to make it to fit. They want to get uh, heroism into the story. They want uh, uh, actors that will um, be able to uh, avoid the doom. They think that they're doing something special. Uh, but only Christians can escape. The wicked people are not going to be able to escape. They're going to be part of the problem and they're going to join in with the problem rather than avoiding it. Um, plus the the theater stories try to say that everybody gets taken away in a, uh, in a moment and a great tribulation will come and, and they will be caught up to be with the Lord in the air or somewhere. Um, they uh, probably don't use the word air, they just say heaven. Uh, but screen watchers are getting uh, bombarded with stuff that is not real life and not the real way that it's going to turn out. So it's good to go to the Bible and look it up and to study on what, what the Scripture actually says. I've got some of it written out here so that I can go faster than going to and from. Anyway, the uh, we don't want daily news too much, but sometimes when we're watching the news, it says to pray for Israel. Well, if you don't know what's happening over there, how are you going to pray for it? So we do need to watch the news in thinking of... Uh, People that are in danger of trouble, uh, Florida could use a whole lot of prayers. And uh, Israel and some other countries uh, we hear of on the news that we should be praying for those people over there that are believers, but they're in the middle of the mess. There's not much of a way to get out of it. Um, the Lord can protect us from damage and from uh, hurtful situations wherever we are in the world. And... Um, even in the Old Testament, when they prayed to the Heavenly Father, they said, when people will pray to this building, pray to this piece of ground, pray to Jerusalem, pray to that city, that uh, please hear them, Lord, is kind of what the prayer is like. Please hear them, because they're praying to you, Heavenly Father, and give them uh, benefits, blessings, protections, and so on. So... Uh, yeah, there's a, quite a stir nowadays too with people that are, are, are thinking rightfully that the end has got to be near. And they're looking at these problems and situations of the world and um, 
and they're, so they're, they're telling themselves that there is an end coming. There will be an end. We've got to make ourselves ready for that. Armageddon is mentioned in the Bible only once. But it's, uh, it's a city as well as a, a situation that is going to happen. In uh, Revelation 16, 16, it says, And they gathered them together to a place called, in the Hebrew, Armageddon. It's an awful and terrible uh, fear that has been placed in people's minds as well. The place is described also in verse 14 of that same chapter, 16 verse 14. Uh, For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of and of the whole world to gather them together of the great day of the Lord God Almighty. So sometimes this day is called by different names, the great day of the Lord God Almighty, the day of judgment. Um, d- different words are used, and it's a fear that... It, Satan is stirring up as well. He wants to stir up the trouble. He doesn't want to ease off at all. He just wants to keep everybody worried. The word Armageddon is uh, incorporating the Hebrew name Megdudo. 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 Yeah, Megdudo. And uh, it's in the plains of, and I'll use the other word, it's uh, Jezreel. (laughs) Uh, It's easier than, than the other one. Uh, a geographical location. So I looked this up and started thinking about where would it be? Well, if you flew into Tel Aviv and then went uh, north, um, about 25, 30 miles, 50 miles, uh, you'd come to a mountain range that's kind of going like that. And that mountain range is, uh, is uh, oh, I saw it here, Uh, Carmel, Carmel, and I I don't think of it quite that way, so it caught me last night when I was looking it over again, second time or more, Carmel. So I really looked it up some more, and the mountain range is Carmel, but I think of the Mount Carmel. So it's kind of at the eastern, let's see, let's get a right, western end of that mountain range. That's east, but this is west. (laughs) But uh, if you're looking at a map, you usually think of up and what's in front of you. And it's to the left on that. And so if you went along the ocean edge, followed along, there must be a higher hill up there because of the story in the Bible about the uh, Mount Carmel. And uh, it sometimes is just referred to as Carmel. But this valley that's kind of over the other side goes goes down towards... Uh, um, I'll look for it here. Nazareth, Nazareth area. So it's going down that way. But it's evidently fairly flat land or it would be flooded at times. And, and yet it's uh, got a mountain at that end where um, Elijah went up and prayed to God about the, uh, the uh, bad guys that were trying to cut themselves and so on to get their God to listen to them. Yeah, there's a whole story. So Mount Carmel is well known, and it's easy to find them in in any Bible. It's in this little Bible, as well as maps on walls, or or you can look it up on on the internet nowadays, and to find out where this place is. Well, they're all being gathered to this place where this uh, there's a actually down the slope of that area, uh, presuming it's sloping that way because Mount Carmel's up this way, you know. Um, but there is a city that is actually called uh, Armageddon, or, or Armageddon, yeah. But so it's, it's a name of a place, as well as the name of a battle that's going to be near there. So Armageddon is, is used uh, a couple of times that way, but we everybody seems to know Armageddon. It's talked about enough of where the battle is going to be and how bad it's going to be in the judgment days that's going to come. So... Uh, we need to keep an eye on it. Uh, Jesus let us know that we need to be particularly warned of it and to think of it and be ready for the battle that's going to come there as well as the judgment day that's coming. 
And these angels in the book of Revelation, we talked about some last week. So verse 16 has some to talk about. Uh, Revelation 16, 12 through 16 reads this way. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. And these bowls that they're pouring out are the wrath of God. So on Euphrates. And its water was dried up so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to battle uh, of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Oh, that's in the middle of this story. It's almost like one story cuts off a little bit and these, these words are put in and then this other thought is brought in and yet it's all in the one verse. So we need to be mindful that when other verses talk about he's coming as a thief in the night, it's got double meanings and double ways of understanding it. That we don't be surprised by a bad person coming to the door and trying to break in. It is quite disconcerting to have those things happen to you. It's happened to us twice, I guess. <laughs> but um, that's what it's going to be like, is uh, if you're unprepared and don't know of the Lord's coming and don't know when he's coming, why he's coming and what it's all about, uh, the end has to come sometime. So actually it shouldn't bother us. If it gets worse, Jesus' coming must be that much closer. Not to make that fear or to damage our, our reasoning and understanding. So it's going to be a surprise when he comes. If I find that spot here again. He's coming as a thief in the night. Blessed is he that watches. Stay awake. Keep alert. He'll watch for other aircraft. I mean, uh, people have said these things many, many times about being careful on what's around you. Be prepared for the future. Prepare for what's likely to happen. Uh, or is going to happen. So that verse again says, Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, keeps everything all intact, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. If you say, well, I was one that knew the Bible, and but you don't know, that would be embarrassing. That would be a shame. So we need to know the Scriptures. And they gathered them together to one place called in the Hebrew Armageddon. Various battles in the Middle East are going on all the time with the river Euphrates uh, causing difficulties and uh, we're supposed to watch those areas, watch what's going on. Uh, Armageddon is the one that we're talking about today because it could all of a sudden be on us, be around us and at us. False alarms uh, usually lull the weary into complacency. If we don't keep our wits about us, don't know what it's all about, um, you know, there's been so many battles and things going on even in the last uh, 25, 30 years, about 30 years or so. Desert Storm, a few of those things. I can remember where I was when we heard the news of the Desert Storm. Um, meaning battle. Uh, and and if, you're, if you get lulled to sleep, you let things just go, and, oh, it's happened before, we've heard that 10 times already, or um, you are lulled away into complacency, and it can erode your faith. That's the scary part. If you just say, oh, that, we've heard that before, uh, it can destroy your faith or others that are around you we need to be sharp on those things. We should always be aware of the possibilities while diligently continuing our service to the Lord. We could look up all the bad things. Think about all the bad things that are going on. Churches that are being bulldozed down. Uh, buildings that are being sold. Buildings that are blown up in the newspaper just recently. A building blew up 
on purpose. They were destroying a church. They blew it up. If we uh, just say all of these things are, are somewhat normal, uh, we can let it get to us or, or destroy us or, or diminish our, fa- our faith. We're not diligently continuing in service. We can be lulled to sleep. A combat in Revelation 16 will at some point be joined in the valley of Megiddo. The battle of Armageddon may be a uh, a lineup in the ultimate war for the control of Jerusalem. They don't want Jerusalem to survive. They don't want it to to be able to be a, a, a international name. They don't want people to know that name. They want to destroy that city. And that's predicted in the Bible many places. And they've tried in the past to destroy it, burn it down and so on. We understand that there's now seven, did somebody say just this week that there's seven red heifers that have been named or placed or known to be in the red heifer place in this new temple that's going to be tried to be built or finished. Uh, I, I really can't believe that that temple is really going to get there. But they're going to try. Because God's ultimate goal is not to reinstate the old system of the Old Testament. It's a warning device. Say, hey, take note of this. This could happen if you don't watch. If you're not awake, you're not praying, you're not making yourself ready, and so on. You, you need to be ready for this ultimate war that's going to come at Jerusalem. Or consider its proximity to the contested holy city, as they always called it. It's only a few miles away, 50 miles away maybe. Um, It could be just a phase of the ultimate struggle when this gets going. What what all is it going to include? How many people? Which we see this more clearly by introducing other texts that most students of prophecy recognize as parallel ideas or thoughts with the Armageddon of Revelation 16. Like... Zechariah 14, and others. We'll get to some of them here. Uh, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all nations to battle at Jerusalem. That's in Zechariah 14, 1 and 2. Interesting. That's a that's a neat chapter to read of what's going to happen during those time frames and what's, what subjects come up in Zechariah 14. Prophecy is indicating that it's at Jerusalem when we read that chapter. Uh, it's focused on this last great battle of our age or the ages, end of the age. That's why the war in the Middle East involves Israel often triggers triggers speculation that the Battle of Armageddon is at hand. When you start hearing troubles over there and you know that Jerusalem is involved in it, you know Israel's involved in it, uh, you know what kind of people are there, what their background was, you know something about all of that. And so as soon as you start hearing of a battle over there, you say, oh, it must be that this is part of it that's going to be a battle for getting all nations to come. Uh, What does that really mean? If we look at all nations, it doesn't mean that these 150 some, 160 countries are going to all show up. But one thing for sure, the United Nations is going to be there. And they represent a touching of all these other nations. So uh, New Zealand won't have to send people there necessarily. It could. All nations. If you take 150 countries and they all send soldiers, that's going to be a terrible situation. United Nations is a difficult thing to understand, but it could be that it kind of tries to keep peace and is involved. So all nations are represented that way. Uh, 
central idea of Zechariah develops as he describes the war for, for Jerusalem is that its climatic battle will be in process when the great day of the Lord comes and Christ suddenly returns. Remember, that chapter's a little hard. Some of it's here. Some of it's here that I've already got written out, so I won't have to look it up. But that uh, Zechariah 14, it just starts down the list and starts giving you the real battles that are going on. And it's wise to read that and to get some depth in that. So here's part of it here. And the Lord will go forth and battle against those nations as he fought in the day of battle. It's from Zechariah, or Ezekiel, pardon me, Ezekiel. Uh, And Zechariah is going to be here in a moment as well, both of these. Um, And in that day his feet will land on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west and and make a, a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and the other half towards the south. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you or with him, with you, with you. And that's chapter 14, 1 through 5. Verse 5. Then if we went to the prophecy again in Zechariah 14, confirms the uh, Armageddon scenario from Revelation 16 and connects it solidly with the second coming of Christ to earth. So when you're looking at these verses here and there and there, at least these three that I'm mentioning today, you begin to get the idea that the prophets of the Old Testament were prophesying of our time way down the way. Uh, Old Testament scriptures, here's one in, um, in in Ezekiel. I think this is it right here. Yeah. I, oh, I wrote it out to the side. Ezekiel 38, 3 through 6. So that's Ezekiel 38, 3 through 6. And say, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I, behold, I am against you, Gog. The word I is missing out of there in my typing. (laughs) Uh, O Gog, the prince of Rush, R-O-S-H. I don't know if you say Rosh. And then uh, uh, Michel and Tubal. Uh, These are hard words to say, and they're not current countries. But we understand that that's those people that settled were by the Russian people. Uh, We don't want to blame stuff on Russia. It's just that they happen to live there. And then God says further in the, in the Bible that he's going to come with hooks in their jaws to draw them, to do, obey him, to go with him to where he wants to take them. He's going to lead them out of Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, and with them Gomer. So some of these countries are named and they're not necessarily the same land dividing of where they were. Uh, because things did change when you changed to 150, 160 countries. The names change. Um, there's going to be troops coming uh, far north and far south, different places. So that's uh, Ezekiel 38, 3 through 6. Countries are named as well. Watch out for the New King James naming of some of the countries and the older King James naming the same country. They may not be pronounced the same or even close to the same. They may not represent the countries of our world. But when it says all countries are coming, it's going to be a big deal. Yet we'll know that it's happening. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, the prophet describes a tremendous end time war and identifies some of the nations and peoples involved. That will be enough to tell us. This great war was to occur after Israel's restoration as a nation in verse 8. 
uh, which happened in what year? 1948, 1948, when Israel was able to go back and set up their, their country and set up their, their uh, government, their business. Um, it would not have happened otherwise. This is a miracle situation and it's pointing to the end of the world is coming nearby. Though Ezekiel, or through Ezekiel, God reveals the intention of those nations who oppose Israel in the latter years. The names are given, some names are given. So here's part of this verse as well, 11 and 12. Ezekiel 38, 11 and 12. Uh, you will say, I will go up against the land of unveiled, uh, unwalled, unwalled villages. I will go uh, to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having their bars, nor, neither bars nor gates, undefended city. You'll think it's all safe. Okay, and it carries on. All of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against the people gathered from the nations. The Hebrew people are coming home, been doing that for 25, 30, 40 years. They're getting back to that same country who have acquired livestock, the King James doesn't say livestock, but animals, and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. That's in, in Ezekiel 38, 11 and 12. If it was reference to climatic things at the end time battle, as we understand them, then Israel will be at rest. Unwalled cities? Yeah. No, no fear, dwelling safely and not focusing on their defenses? Why bother if you, things are going real good? That is not quite the current picture. Right. Missiles come their way and they have to send up their fighters. They have to use the Patriot type defense to shoot down things that are coming their way. That's uh, Some of these things we have to realize are man's interpretation of scriptures that they don't understand in thousands of years difference in time frame and trying to explain what an airplane is. Yeah, it's a little hard to do. So, um, um, with the appearance of peace being achieved just prior to the time of the prophecies of Ezekiel, Zechariah, and John from book of Revelation. Students of prophecy associate this lull in hostilities with Paul's words at the latter time. Peace and safety? Yeah. Here's, a, here's 1 Thessal Thessalonians 5, 1, 2, 3. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you not exactly so, is it? We always need a warning. We always need another jab, poke. Hey, get ready. Don't, don't lose your faith. Don't let things fall down on you. We, we need some excitement, some pickup. But the, the times and the seasons, why would we not have to know? We've got it right here. Why have somebody preach to us about it? Because we do have it. We've got it in the scriptures that we need to read. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains on a pregnant woman or travail, the King James, the older King James says travail upon a woman with child. Um, they shall not escape. It's going to happen. It's going to come. Better be ready because you're not going to just escape. See, some teach this escaping by um, 
running away to heaven, escaping to heaven or whatever. Um, they have the tribulation and so on, the uh, escape from tribulation. But that's not really true. The Bible is saying what it's really going to be. It's going to be a battle. It's going to be a problem. Our understanding that the United Nations thinks of the Middle East has finally been satisfied when there is peace and safety. They'll think, okay, United Nations, we did it. See, we, we showed how it could be done. We helped all these countries, and now we've got peace and safety. And that's not what's going to happen. When suddenly the peace will break, won't hold, and the nation in Ezekiel 38 names the uh, allied countries that are going to be coming and what kind of problems there's going to be for Palestine and Israel because they're coming against Israel. Then there's uh, some pose the idea that these events are yet future. Um, you know, if you overdo that, you're not going to be prepared. We've had warnings in uh, 48, 60 something or other, uh, 70, 72, we've had warnings. Uh, we've had this warning and that warning and that warning and that warning. Right? We're, we're having warnings. There are problems over there. And the time is going to come when it'll all come together. Uh, we don't want to be surprised. It's going to be a grim situation. It might have Russia in it. But if you look at how much Russia has been diminished, um, and yet how much damage they're doing to other countries around them, uh, with the oil and with the missiles and with this and that, how many people are dying, um, is Russia going to be the main one to get involved with going to Jerusalem? Sure, making a lot of trouble at the present time. And whether they can be sustained or held, uh, I don't know. It's just it's not there. The Bible doesn't say, say Russia. It doesn't come right out and say that. But all those people are going to be going. All people are going to be going. So you name the country and it'll be there. Um, the other people want to make an, an excuse, I guess you might say, that horses and horsemen and shields and helmets and swords of all kinds of weapons uh, way different than modern weapons. But it's just telling us that there's a big battle coming, a big problem coming. Ezekiel had no knowledge of modern warfare, warfare. And why would God try to explain through Ezekiel uh, what a helicopter is, what a missile is, that it flies seemingly without power? No, it doesn't. Yeah, it's too hard to explain. So they go back to talking about horsemen coming and how many people are coming for the battle. And uh, when Jesus comes back, he comes riding a horse, a white horse. It was custom for kings of those days and of the old countries to come on a, on a horse, showing their authority and power. So in Revelation 19, verse 11, Again, read the King James as well as the revised um, versions of the King, King James. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. It's chapter 19, verse 11. Such language is symbolic as there are many other end-time prophecies would be doing the same kind of thing, using symbolic terms. Okay, true and faithful, the white horse, putting together a number of other stories to find out, well, yes, this is Jesus that's coming. Nations of the East are named, but sometimes not the exact names. The Battle of Armageddon, when Christ returns, that's in chapter, again, I was telling you the three chapters that I was concerned about was Ezekiel 38, Zechariah 14, and Revelation 16. If you hung on to those and read them, and of course you can read a little beforehand and a little afterwards, a chapter each way maybe, and you get a better idea of where it's coming from and who it is, 
and Gog was the descendants of those people that went up there and lived uh, in what is now known as Russia. So it's an um, individual interpretation, I guess you could say, as to what countries these were or where the descendants lived and where they moved to and how big this battle is going to be. But it's going to be going to Armageddon uh, with great power and uh, taking the... It talks about the people of the East joining in. And we could get into a situation as to uh, the river Euphrates, who's going to close it? Because right here is that verse. Um, when the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its waters dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. It's Revelation 16, verse 12 in the King James. In Revelation 17 and verse 15, the waters represent people, multitudes, and nations. Thus the meaning could be that the nations bordering the Euphrates will be unable to impede the invading armies from the further east. Um, I don't know that rising of the sun makes any statement, but uh, that's a possibility of people using that term, the rising of the sun meaning east. That they'll come from the east and come through the river Euphrates on that great day of God Almighty. Because of this prophecy, Bible students watch the international relations of Eastern powers closely to see if they may bring military action against the Middle East. Is this stirring a pot that is eventually going to work these people in? That's what some newscasters are trying to bring, and, and we, of course, have to decipher uh, what they are really getting at, how bad it's going to be. It talks about the hordes from Asia. That's not a very nice term. It just means that there's a lot of people there. And if they start coming, they used to say in the Second World War, they can march people off of, the, off of a bluff to be killed, at 10 abreast, and they would never run out of people because there's more babies being born behind the scenes. They'll keep coming. So we need to be careful in what is the right timing and not right. The kings of the east enter into the fray. The Bible does use that word fray. And will result in a great conflict. Of course, we're seeing that in, in uh, Ezekiel 38, 13. Speaking of nations or powers who will challenge the spoiling or looting of Israel. Is somebody actually going to defend Israel? Not too likely because they're after it all for themselves. If they did, it would stir up more trouble. Well, then in uh, that verse, uh, Ezekiel 38, 13, it names a bunch of cities that could be coming, this country and that country and that country and that country and that country. So you want to read there. It talks about livestock and good, uh, goods that they would be plundering, taking. Uh, so don't, don't forget to read Ezekiel 38, 13 and onward. Uh, I think it's going to be not just a visual uh, or a verbal resistance. I think it's going to be bigger than that because they don't want this to happen. They want the goodies for themselves and so on. Only God knows. The current events will finally pertain to uh, prophetic drying up of the waters of the Euphrates and the battle of Armageddon and the battle of the great day of the Lord God Almighty this battle will terminate by the action of our, our God. When fury comes up in his face, Scripture says, against those that have rejected him, the Heavenly Father, and have opposed him throughout history, uh, that's going to be even stronger reasons why God will step in. When God has determined that wickedness is no more, no longer to be tolerated, yet our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him 
and it shall be very tempemp tempestulence. Temp oh, can't get that word to come. Temp to us round about. That's in Psalm 50, verse 3, which I had on here where I was ending my study. <laughs> um, so you want that, that uh, Psalm 50, verse 3. I put some arrows next to lines, meaning this is something special I wanted to touch on. The Lord has a reason for the battle of Armageddon. He doesn't have to explain to us. He's got a reason. It is to determine the realm of the wicked rulers and begin the reign of Jesus with those who believe and obey him. So you got two problems going on. You got this battle coming up, you got all this struggle, all this looting, all this other stuff going on because they don't want to obey the Heavenly Father. They're going to fight him. They don't want to obey him. But it'll also bring a time when Jesus is coming. So when it gets worse and worse and worse, we need to say, Jesus has got to come pretty soon. And that's a good thing. Yeah, we'd love to have him rule over us and, and fix the troubles of this world. The battle of Armageddon is a time of judgment. Judgment time. Time to establish a rule of righteousness. A time when the children of God receive their inheritance. It's a good thing. And the children of Satan will lose their power. Satan sneaks in on such seemingly small things. Uh, Pearl and I spent an hour, <laughs> at least an hour, with our Bibles and with uh, ways of hunting up verses and so on because there was trickery being used in what seems to be a new Bible that's being handed out, sold, or whatever, a new, new kind of Bible. And it is actually promoting wrong thinking. We have to be careful of that because it's uh, very easy for somebody to warp the meaning just a little. And then, of course, it goes further. This has been the safest for me for all of my life. I saw in my notes in the front of my older Bible that indicated that it was 1963, wasn't it? When I first got a version, a version, this exact Bible, page for page, number for number, number at the bottom of the page, page for page, and then I bought another one that would be identical. So I've used this same Bible since 1963. I've not had trouble. There's a few things you have to watch out for. Old English to New English and word change meanings and so on. But other than that, not bad. The conflict in the Middle East have occurred for centuries. There's always conflict over there. The students of the Bible acknowledge that, that Jesus is talking about the return is coming. When the Pharisees and Sadducees came and tested him, Jesus, asked that he would show them the sign from heaven. And he answered and said unto them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites. That's what you are. You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 1, 2, 3. Matthew 16. One through three. People of knowledge in our world, they can discern what the weather's going to be like so many hours ahead of time or how many days ahead of time now it is. And he said, but you can't understand these signs that are coming? Ah, come on now. Jesus is challenging us to read the scriptures, know the scriptures, and understand how close it is and how soon it is. And we should be happy that it is coming. Throughout Matthew 24 and Luke 21, the Savior speaks of the end of the age being filled up with wars, international conflicts, famines, pestilences, persecutions, false prophets, false messiahs. In 
2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 5, Paul speaks of the last days being perilous and giving the reasons of, for the conditions. And here's this verse right here. Uh, so 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, lovers uh, uh, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, heady, um, high, strong, headstrong. <laughs> okay, I'm not used to that. That's a different King James, New King James, I guess. Um, uh, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And from such turn away. When we know the, the these things are warned to us, we know that they're going to come. We, we see them happening. Uh, in fact, every day I am shocked by what I'm hearing of what the little kids are acting like. You know, they grow up. And they become our police and our lawyers and our judges. And oh, are we in trouble. I thought back 40 years ago, I told this same thing to a neighbor boy because he was acting up and I was having to take him to his daddy. And his daddy was drunk at another person's house and he was going to get a beating. And I said, you know, I'd like you to grow up to be a, a good person. And that one day you will be our policeman, our judge and our lawyers and school teachers. And I said, I'd like to see you grow up to be a good person. Well, it's gotten worse. From such people turn away. Well, we can't be buddy buddy with them. That's for sure. But the turning away, sometimes we have to be able to think of: Is there any hope to win that person's allegiance or, or uh, um, wisdom and understanding? Is is there any hope? Well, as long as there's life, there's hope. But sometimes we don't want to waste our time when we're just throwing our pearls before the swine. We have to make some decisions on how much we can devote to winning a person that is warped already because of heady, high-minded, whatever. Um, the, when you see these things, the end of this age is not far off. And man, it is so close. It's like every week, one day a week, we go to do grocery shopping and this shopping and that shopping. You know, we do things all in one day. And every time we come home, we are just shocked at what the world is doing, what it's like. Paul, like Jesus, indicated that Christians have enough information to recognize what's going on in this day, and it's arrived. We are not in darkness and should be wide awake and know our times to prepare for our times that we're in. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that that day should uh, uh, overtake you as a thief. There's another place with a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. Therefore, let us uh, not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober Sober really involves reading the scriptures and under, understanding the scriptures, knowing the scriptures. Um, like I'm saying, what is that? That's uh, 60 years. I'm stuck with one Bible. We need to know it and understand it that we can live properly and righteous in the world. For those who sleep, sleep in the night. Those that get drunk are drunk in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and have on the helmet of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's First Thessalonians 5, 6 through 9. <coughs> For those who trust in Jesus, 
we are to, we are walking in faith and love toward him and others. We need to be in love, trying to win people. The Battle of Armageddon is one more of the awful times of terror. Satan wants to make us afraid. He wants to give us terror. We know Jesus wins. Like one said, like a football game. We win. <laughs> yeah, we win. Because we know the scriptures and how it ends. It is an awesome and terrible time when all good promises of God in favor of his people will come true. That's what he says. When he comes, he'll bring the rewards with him. May God bless you.